Batman hat mich informiert, dass ich muss auf Englisch reden. So I'll go from now on in English, which is indeed my mother tongue. So um, uh, it makes my life a bit easier, but the slides will be in German. So this is a bit, uh, a bit of a strange mix. Anyway, let's see what happens. Uh, the, um, the links to download the materials are available at the bottom there, and those links will also be given at the end of the presentation. Um, as Marcus said, my presentation is not about the content of, uh, of online politics or the individual particular campaigns. This is basically a kind of tactical update. Facing the next five years of online campaigning in Brussels, what works, what doesn't work, and it's for you to work out how these tactics can apply to the individual campaigns that each of you will be running. Okay, um, so the first point is that citizen participation in European Union politics already works, and we have plenty of examples of that from within the, the net uh, political environment and also outside it. One of the most successful campaigns was not to do with anything to do with tech, it was actually to do with fishing. This is the campaign Hughes Fish Fight. This gentleman here is a well-known television chef in the UK, and he parked his fishing boat outside the European Parliament, and every time you signed the online petition, the numbers went up on the side of the fishing boat. And you can see the slogan on the side of his uh, fishing boat, it says, you cannot ignore 676,000 people. That campaign was cited by the European Parliament as one of the main reasons why the fishing reform that they passed two years ago could be considerably greener than the members of the European Parliament had initially expected. Another environmental campaign which was extremely successful was that about a particular type of pesticide called neonicotinoids, which has been behind the decrease in bee populations um, across Europe. Here there were seven online petitions, each of which gathered a five-figure number of signatures. Those petitions were directed towards policymakers in Brussels, and the European Commission proposed a two-year ban on these pesticides as a result, starting from December of 2013. So that ban is ongoing. And one which is closer to the hearts of the people here this evening is, of course, the act of protests. Those type of protests will have to be uh, redone and refought, perhaps with regard to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. More about that coming up in just a moment. The difficulty, however, of what Brussels needs to see is what does a person mean to Brussels, or what does indeed the signature of an, online pet, um, uh, of an online petition, or indeed any participation in an online activity mean? So for example, if we take the Green member of the European Parliament, Scar Keller, who has been very opposed to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, she has been very much in favor of mass citizen activity against the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. But one of the most successful online activities that probably none of you in this room have ever heard of is a campaign called One of Us, which is a campaign against abortion, which has gathered two million signatures, which is more than the number of signatures gathered against the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. You will not find a green politician like Scar Keller saying that there is a mass citizen movement behind the campaign to ban abortion. Now, why do I cite those examples? It's essentially because you have to work out when building your online campaigns towards Brussels is which politicians are you going to push and you've got to make sure you're pushing the right ones. It's not purely a mass mobilization. It has to be a mass mobilization towards the right people who are essentially going to be on your side from the beginning. The second major point is the European Citizens Initiative, which is considered the best kind of formal tool in the Brussels environment for getting your voice heard, remains a very, very complicated tool to use. There is a currently a debate ongoing in Brussels to improve the functioning of this tool, but at the moment, as we stand here today, it's very, very difficult to make that tool function. One of the, six, most, the only two successful citizens initiatives, that is you get one million signatures gathered within a 12 month period. One of us that I just mentioned is one of those two successful petitions. The other is this campaign entitled Water is a Human Right, the, the Right to Water campaign. Gathered 1.8 million signatures, but because the power in the tool is so weak, 
the European, part, the European Commission sorry, has not actually acted upon what the demand was within this European Citizens Initiative. So be very, very careful. The tool, the European Citizens Initiative, sounds appealing, but the practicalities of making it work from a tactical point of view remain very, very difficult. For any of you that ever tried to build a European Citizens Initiative, the technology is very, very cumbersome to use and the code that the European Commission makes available is very, very hard. So you'll end up with a reaction like this. It will drive you quite crazy trying to actually manage to make one of those things work. So what you need to do instead, if you're looking to build campaigns towards the European Union institutions in the next five years, is to be creative and clever about it rather than thinking through the formal procedures. So here are a few ideas and a few suggestions. This was the campaign that Greenpeace ran about the activists that had been imprisoned by Russia in the Arctic on the Arctic sunrise. What they allowed you to do was, was personalize your participation in the online activity, i.e. could you send an additional signal to the receivers of the petition according to the message that you yourself wrote, i.e. a personalized email matters a lot more than just one click or one signature on an online petition. A second idea is, can you differentiate between the type of people that are participating? So back to the bees petition that I mentioned, is the signature of one beekeeper equal to the signature of one farmer whose crops then may have bigger problems with pollinization or whatever, or one crop scientist, or indeed just one motivated green voter? Okay? So bear that in mind, and if you're then a policymaker like Scarkella on the receiving end, how do you ma measure or value what, those, what that number means? And how as a campaigner are you going to signify that to the individual politician? Another way is, can you make your campaign physical? This is an old campaign run by Vattenfall, uh, not exactly the most uh, ethical company, but it's quite a creative campaign. You could sign a climate pledge on Vattenfall's website. For every signature of the pledge, they made a little orange man, you know, just so high, plastic man, and they carpeted Place Luxembourg outside the European Parliament with 200,000 of these plastic men. So when they were doing their lobbying in the building behind, they could po literally point out of the window and say, here are 200,000 people that have come to lobby you. It was a very, very creative and interesting campaign. Similar sorts of things need to be replicated more often. Can you, when you are building your campaigns, try to make sure that your campaigning aims are clear from the very beginning? In English, and I've tried to translate them here as best I possibly can, uh, good campaigns towards the EU institutions comply with SMART objectives. You see in English, S-M-A-R-T. So that to make your campaign, it doesn't work in German, S-M-E-R-Z-B or something. Anyway, the basic idea is can you, make, yeah, yeah, can you make your campaign as concrete and practical as possible? So working through the bees campaign, through this, specific, we wish to ban a particular type of pesticide. Measurable, can you make it clear that your aims have been achieved? Yes, if the pesticide is banned, then that's uh, doable. Is it achievable? That campaign was not banning all pesticides. It wasn't dealing with environmental issues in general. It was one narrow, specific demand targeted to an individual politician. Was it realistic, and were there enough resources behind it? Well, bearing in mind lots of NGOs were involved, probably so. And time constrained, that pesticide campaign had to start in the winter, sorry, the end point of the campaign had to be winter time, because that's the time when the bees are not pollinating crops. So therefore, there was a, there was a target date by which the, the, the ban had to come in. So therefore, behind all of those effective campaigns, the aim matches a smart objective. There are plenty of campaigns that don't. What has happened at Brussels level to deal with poverty in Greece, for example? The Open Society Institutes, that's George Soros, who has a lot of money to put behind his campaigns, ran a massive effort called Solidarity Now, which sank without a trace. Why should I sign Solidarity Now? Well, because I don't actually know what is going to happen 
on the basis of that demand. The demand is too unclear. It is too vague. And if it's addressed to a policymaker, the policymaker does not know how to engage with that campaign on the basis of the vagueness of what's written on, down on their website. So that's money down the drain as far as, uh, as, far as I'm concerned in, in online campaigns. To so the final two points. What about the EU institutions and what's changed in Brussels after uh, the 2009 European elections? The European Commission first. The European Commission is the executive of the European Union's institutions. It's like the closest you've got to a, the Bundesregierung, so the government, if you like. Rather than having one commissioner responsible for digital affairs, we now have two commissioners responsible for digital affairs in the, uh, the European Commission. Uh, if they are approved by the European Parliament, which is still ongoing, probably a foregone conclusion for both of these, sadly, in, the, in the respect of the second one here. Um, the top gentleman is uh, Andrus Ansip, who is the vice president of the European Commission, who has responsibility for the digital single market. He is an Estonian liberal. And uh, the gentleman underneath, as many of you know, is Gunther Oettinger, the uh, former minister president of Baden-Württemberg. The joke was doing the rounds in Brussels that actually he had to have a, have a, a course to work out how to turn on a computer uh, for when he was uh, nominated for, for this position. But nevertheless, he comes from the biggest political group uh, present in the EU institutions. So his nomination will probably be safe. And therefore, and there are also other polit politicians in Brussels that are even less competent. <laughs> nevertheless, that means that when you're building your campaigns, we do not know at the moment what the relationship between these two is going to be. And probably on the basis of what we've heard these last couple of weeks, ANSIP is probably going to be more favorable towards the kind of digitale Gesellschaft sort of agenda of, of online politics than uh, Oettinger will be. But there'll be an we have to learn and work out in the coming weeks exactly how this balance will go. And then lastly, on the European Parliament, after the European elections, there's been notable changes in the power of the different political groups in the European Parliament. That's like the Fraktionen in the Bundestag. There has been a notable increase in two groups that are not exactly favorable to the sort of agenda that you guys are probably going to be pushing. That is the European Conservatives and Reformists group, delightfully contradictory even in the name, uh, which is a group of basically Polish right-wingers and British conservatives. And the EFDD of Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy, that is the, the, um, the get-together of Nigel Farage of the British Eurosceptics and a Beppe Grillo of the Cinque Stella movement uh, in Italy, which is a rather odd combination. But both of those groups are stronger in the European Parliament than they were before. Two groups which were notably favorable towards the kind of uh, Netzpolitische agenda, if you like. The Liberals, uh, Alde, and the Greens, European Free Alliance, are notably weaker in this European Parliament than they were in the previous European Parliament. So the number of natural allies that there are for, um, uh, for, for, for net politics themes is lower, so therefore we're going to have to be even more determined and even more creative to get our messages through. That is all for my uh, introduction. Those are the Creative Commons images which I've used uh, for illustrating my slides. Uh, and then once more to the slide with the, the link to the uh, downloads. And for those watching on the live stream, um, I'll answer the questions on Twitter if any are posed on Twitter uh, at the close of uh, this speech. Thank you very much.